good afternoon to all so now we are live uh, for the first live session for internationalism about forum 2020 today we are going to discuss an impeccable issue which is uh, india's uh, avenues as a member of the united nations uh, amidst the 75th, 75th anniversary of the united nations so this discussion is something which is at the heart of indian foreign policy because uh, we all must understand that uh, the founding members of the un not all of them but a few of them and or some of them and which i and i don't include the permanent members right now they actually had certain important roles to shape the way united nations works apart from the permanent members have obviously contributed certain nations like uh, india uh, new zealand singapore israel uh, saudi arabia and even certain african nations from the global south have contributed to the united nations in some way or the other be it security issues human rights education or anything so today we have uh, mr sarthak roy from the commonwealth human rights initiative and uh, i would be really happy to introduce sarthak uh sarthak is a graduate from christ team university bangalore and uh, he is an international law academic he has been working with uh, the united nations human rights council and various other programs of the commonwealth human rights initiative especially on the ratification of the united nations convention against torture so i believe uh, sarthak is best for this particular lucrative session where we will discuss Uh, the avenues of indian foreign policy and its connectivity as to how they have involved themselves in the united nations so uh, sarthak it would be great if i would in uh, start by introducing you and i think i've done that so let's waste no much time and let's start the session all together so yes sarthak here we go um, uh, i would be happy if uh, you would enlighten the audience about uh this issue that we are discussing today and why is it so relevant and why we should study this yeah thank you thank you abhivardhan and thank you internationalism team uh, for inviting me uh, it's a pleasure being here and it's it, on a, and talking about a topic which is so important and close to my heart uh primarily there are few things why it's few issues and areas as to why this year is so important obviously we are aware of the fact that there is an ongoing pandemic around us but also the fact that it's the 75th anniversary of the united nations as well as that of the geneva conventions so that so in terms of international politics and international issues these are the two most celebrated uh, documents for for us to follow but now the, here is a dichotomy and the, here is where india can play a role so but before i start out what india's role can be i'll just give a small snapshot of the global scenario right now and with the pandemic playing its part why it has why it is imperative for the india way as our external affairs minister calls it to take shape so right now relations i feel between the most important powers the us russia china are more dysfunctional than ever as the secretary general has once noted unfortunately where there is power there is no leadership and where there is leadership there is lack of power both furthermore when we look at multilateral institutions you have to recognize that currently they are not having that much of teeth or when they do then they don't really have that much of an appetite or they don't want that bite to be present so now what happens is that back in the 1979 1790s uh, immanuel kant made a very simple argument he said that we do not need a world government what we need is democratic nations committed to human rights and the rule of law cooperating for shared ends so what he was actually doing he was essentially calling for a united nations system back then but alternatively what we are right now is in, in you know in a philosophical note is an orwellian 1984 where the spheres of superpower influence where there are no values people lie change enemies and fence fight the day but and now in this juncture to prevent the orwellians from the board of the world health organization non permanent membership on the unsc and chair of g20 
this really affords a great opportunity to achieve favorable multilateral outcomes at this and other bodies and that's why i feel these discussions and playing the united nations system is very important i'm really elated to hear that uh, i think uh, the chairperson of india in the united nations uh, sorry i mean the world health organization a un body uh, is was something kind of a very unusual move because even if it was impeccably nice i think uh, many people did not expect that would happen uh, also uh, expectancy in the lobbying in the general assembly to get india the non permanent unsc membership for 2 years in somewhere down the line a good thing it's a good sign uh, but anyways i think uh, one buzzword which uh, india is endorsing a lot amidst the geopolitical neo realist turbulence is something we know as you know uh, reformed multilateralism uh, before we uh, get on with certain impeccable questions or certain specific things um, would you like to enlighten the audience about reformed multilateralism yeah so in terms of multilateralism so let this i mean and from the indian perspective we have to start it as so i have to start from the initial stages right after india joined the un charter so india's deepening engagement with the united nations traditionally is based on its steadfast commitment to multilateralism and dialogue as the key factors for achieving shared goals and addressing common challenges faced by the global community including those related to peace building and peacekeeping sustainable development poverty eradication environment climate change terrorism disarmament human rights health and pandemics migration and cyber security among others so now what our like recently in large earlier this year during the rising our dialogue i remember our external affairs minister made a very erudite point as to why what is not the india way the india way is not to be a disruptionist power internationally it needs to be a stabilizing power it will not be a self centered and mercantilist power but rather important to towards the global good and global commons being shared by mankind at large and now what what currently in terms of reform multilateralism if you are talking about it would hinge on india's capacities in providing international system to bring a global good like security being a security provider combating terrorism climate change and it should be a more of a decider and a shaper rather than an abstainer from important issues like i mentioned connectivity and climate change so what india owes as a in this whole spectrum of reform multilateralism is being the standard the power bearer from the south and even just power it's very important that india is a just power and india lives up to its voice in a practical way and apart from that in this whole reform multilateralism if we and another aspect of reform multilateralism would be the india brand way which is going through like what is the india brand way it is the extraordinary diaspora that india shares which has connected us with multiple countries like for example india is now like a global palette with yoga traditional medicine shaping the international relations discourse at least in the last 5 years but so these are the new facets of you know reform multilateralism that india is leading a charge of and let's not forget in the climate change aspect apart from uh, the paris agreement and speaking by it, india has negotiated and has led the global alliance uh, which is, which is almost like 130 countries coming together i think in this way this this adds on to india's uh, role in terms of being a in the reform multilateral country yeah that's really nice to know so let's get on with some interesting questions so valdeep would you like to start yeah um thank you very much abhi so um are if you have any questions like uh, can you begin with the session like we are in yeah, the session yeah sure sure yeah if you have any okay, questions okay so yeah. let's uh, start with a brief introduction of the moderators so Uh, my name is Arya Kumar Sindhraja. I'm the Chief Operations Officer of International Leasing, and uh, we are with Mr. Bhagat Singh. He is the editor of Howal Desit, the magazine of the Vikas Theory. So, okay, 
it's a really great session and we are just going to discuss about an amazing topic that is about the role of india united nation okay so before this going to the topic i just remember one thing like uh, before some days i have listened in one news that un secretary uh, kofi annan he had said uh, once that uh, in here said one that over the decades india has made an enormous contribution to united nation like through the efforts of the government and the work of the indian scholars indian soldiers and uh, international civil servants like india has been the one of the most voices that helping united nation from the very beginning like uh, it is the one of the founding member in the united nation as well uh, yes so i like to ask that the bear my first question like yeah uh, but in the current situation what we are which we just look at that in the index like uh, there is the happiness index and the e government survey that is done by the united nation what we observe that the rank of india is decreasing day by day i mean uh, in the in, in the, the the rank of india in happiness index that is 144 and it is i just want to state that the rank of our neighbor countries like uh, nepal is in the 92 pakistan even pakistan is in at the rank 66 but india is at the happiness index so rule of india it is, it is 144 that so what do you think about this like uh, why this degradation of this rank so the the fact is india's uh, uh, domestic concerns and its multilateral engagement there's a disparity between that domestically there is obviously a question mark regarding india's treatment of its minorities which we can uh, engage and watch and i think these are one of the factors which play into this uh, indexes like the happiness index and uh, you know, gross happiness happiness index or something like that while on the international front if you look at it like uh, india has been engaging quite a lot uh, with the middle east it was also invited uh, to the oic after a long time which led to even pakistan leaving its chair open and leaving the meeting as large so there is a disparity i must say and acknowledge between india's international engagement and its domestic issues domestic concerns problems at large So now, if you ask me to, uh, technically as to why is there a lack of, you know, a gross happiness index issues, India being ranked lowly? Yes, not only that, there there are the existing problems. Not only gross happiness in uh, issues, like for example, freedom of journalists, the CPJ, Center for Protection of Journalists, and all India is ranking very low in in those indexes, which goes on to show India's domestic problems at large, which 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 is obviously concerning. and which india needs to take note of but i will also highlight i mean in the course of this talk as to why india's problems can also be solved through matured engagement with its domestic people and then engaging at the international front as being the voice of the domestic people and that which is not really happening uh, for the last few years or that matter despite having a stellar external affairs ministry and the prime minister also are leading from the forefront uh interesting part it is um one concern which i have uh, in this regard as to you know um, why india's dom- domestic interests and you know the foreign interests which it you know shows up so beautifully like cooperating with the un on issues related to environment doing so well in south south cooperation uh somewhere how, somewhere down the line balancing uh, the the three main security council powers such as us russia and china we still have that <coughs> i'm so sorry for this we still have that lag between the uh, domestic operations uh, that is at the administrative level and uh, i think uh, that connectivity is not happening uh, yeah we we'll, we have to see how that goes and uh, surely that would be and in i will highlight a small yeah. point as to why they, how it has not happened okay so i sure. mean, i mean yes. why, since i work with the commonwealth human rights initiative so we prepare this report called as the easier said than done report where we assess each, each and every commonwealth country at the hrc's record domestically as well as on the international front basically so obviously india 
joined the uh, HRC last year after obtaining uh, its, its uh, membership in re-election uh, in 2018 and India submitted 28 voluntary pledges and commitments in the area of human rights and uh, presented it as candidate. So now, as like Abhivardhan has mentioned, this whole gap between domestic policies and the international front uh, remains that India's those internationally can be seen. During the 41st session of the Human Rights Council, right before that, like in 20, late 2018, the Indian Supreme Court had decriminalized consensual same-sex relations. But at the HRC, India had maintained its conservative three-year-old position by abstaining from voting on resolution moved by Latin American states, right. seeking to renew the mandate of independent experts on protection against violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Okay. This was despite an irritating campaign in India I of the voting asking authorities to vote in favor of the resolution after the Supreme Court had already decriminalized homosexuality. And the sad part was India had joined Burkina Faso, Angola, DRC, Senegal and Togo democratic credentials in abstaining from the vote. Right. 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 That's something which is weird that uh, despite being uh, the good for, you know, Pax Americana, and also uh, balancing, uh, I should say, uh, Russian interest to an extent, we still get into the, uh, I should say, the block of those uh, which we do not expect, like true with the UN CAT also, that uh, India is one uh, among those unfortunate countries which have not ratified this uh, impeccable convention, which is the need of the hour. So, yes. Yes, I'll tell you. Yeah. Problem also, you know, this dichotomy also lies in the fact that India had once actually propounded, and it's very famous, the Panchi, the five principles of peaceful coexistence yes. for international relations. Yes. Yet again in the 41st session, again in the 41st session, and it had voted against three country resolutions regarding the human rights situations in Philippines. So among yeah. them, the resolutions that called upon the council to take concrete actions against allegations of widespread human rights violations in Philippines. The resolution was also mandated the Philippine government to cooperate with the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and China, Cuba, Cameroon, Angola, and other African countries, which are again and do not have, are all questioned by their democratic status, which is little shameful to say the least, least that we are some way digressing uh, from our core principles in the name of diplomacy and not sticking by it. Right. Right, right. Okay. One Great, aspect yeah. which is uh, often taken, uh, which I find it from the critics of the non-aligned movement and those who often endorse the multi-alignment measure, which uh, uh, Minister Jay Shankar often, you know, talked about in the Carnegie Conference, then in the Atlantic Council, so so, is that uh, uh, Prime Minister Nehru started a very good initiative, non-aligned movement. But the problem was that uh, the major third world countries which joined the non-aligned movement uh, were uh, were often termed as, you know, uh, the flock of the losers or something like that because uh, of more or less they could not advance their commitments. Like Singapore is, and South Korea are certain exceptions in uh, the United Nations system or I should say in the whole, the the, po the past, I should say, the, the, po the past third world countries which actually did well. And able powers. They are at least trying their best in ASEAN. But uh, uh, I think uh, this is one of the very basic criticisms that the NAM members are not endorsing a kind of relevant commitment. So, what do you think about that? Like, yeah. So, India's, you know, the India's non aligned policy during the Cold War and the collective articulation of the same by similarly placed states had influenced immensely the world order and international norm setting. The position that with India, you know, at the forefront of it with other states, developed as a voice of the newly independent states manifesting the development and formalization of legal positions on matters like decolonization, new international economic order, permanent sovereignty over natural resources, differential treatment for developing countries, prohibition of racial uh, discrimination, non government of non-aligned movement, uh, which India was leading to. However, since then, the world and along with the international legal order has changed significantly. The priorities right. of the 1970s and the priorities of international relations and realities of international development, if I must say. Right. So even such as the end of Cold War, neoliberal restructuring, changes in the economic priorities of nation and state, and the rise of violent 
changes to not from non traditional resources like terrorism and other forms of non state actors with incidences like 9/11 2611 are currently reshaping the Indian international legal discourse so influenced by these factors pragmatism is replacing third world solidarity in several aspects and there right. are people in case also no exception exactly yes yeah. like uh, like i mean the world order what sarthak bro said like this has already changed significantly i mean since the end of the cold war like uh, like it is not no longer characterized by bipolarity but by multipolarity and by com- complex interdependence that is what i want to say yeah great um baldeep would yeah. like to proceed yeah. yes sorry sarthak yeah sorry yeah Yes, yes. I was I was just acknowledging the fact that India, I mean, we can observe has drifted in any respect away from its traditional role of a trusted alliance of self-interest, which right. often corresponds with the dominant players on several issues. Dominant players as in the like U.S., like Russia, for that matter, China. So it is it is self-interest which is also taken note of uh, because of the fact that the development agenda is something which India is taking forward uh, actively. and uh, the most interesting thing thing is like for the united states that is the push for uh, united state of america that is uh, first police police the covid the due to emergency of the uh, covid 19 and uh, that is the one of the threats to multilateralism as well and uh, as we all know like the globalization is facing a exi- like the globalization is facing a existential crisis but it is not possible to return to isolation for all of us like this is the time for that so in the world of the complex uh, complex interdependence that countries those are the, the countries they are linked to each other i mean the one way or another yeah that is all okay to my question like uh, yes we all know that uh, the united nation charter that uh, pledges about the organization that will promote higher standards of living full employment and conditions of economic and social progress and development like uh, that says about the high standard of living full employment and conditions for the economic and social development should be there and uh, there should be like solutions of international economic social health and uh, universal respect to all people the fundamental freedom fundamental right and the uh, distinct without the, the equality through the all of the race sex language and the religions and all these things so my point is like is there any impact or any change on the operation of the united nation that is educational scientific or cultural organization like after it says sarthak uh, what is yes. your view upon yes uh so see the, the issues that you highlighted uh, are obviously a, if i can broadly can a broad overview or a broad umbrella of those would be the fact that these are all human rights issues yeah. so these are all human rights issues and if if i have to highlight to everyone to the audience at large that in 1946 when the universal declaration of human rights was being led Uh, and india was at the forefront of the negotiations at that time led by hansa mehta uh, vijay lakshmi pandit as diplomats who were who were acting in the stellar capacity in drafting uh, and at various stages they made several substantive contributions to numerous articles that made up the wd uh, udhr for that matter and like the issues that uh, arya the right now highlighted so i'll just highlight where written and oral contributions were made towards the formation of udhr on various themes for example women's rights india itself insisted on the word men be replaced with human beings on the aspect of non discrimination <laughs> india added the words color and political opinion as criteria for non discrimination on the aspect of freedom of movement india added the article calling for freedom of movement within a country in the aspect of right to work india added the principle of just and favorable conditions of work and finally secularism multicultural culturalism cosmopolitanism invisibility and the universality of all human rights was something india always propounded it but now coming back to the current time and age yes there is like a human rights agenda for that matter 
is sometimes taking a back seat. But the fact is, in the in, during the whole COVID situation, if you look at it, yes, there has there has been a great digital divide. Children have dropped out of schools, but there are problems relating to information accessibility of information on media rights and everything. But if you ask me from the perspective of uh, as, a, as 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 an observer, uh, if I can call myself as the Human Rights Council, despite its all its pitfalls, the special procedures mandate holders, the special reporters, the working groups, independent experts have been very active during this period in order to raise the voice of the voiceless, which includes all the problems that you right, right now highlighted. So yes, it might not be perfect, but these individualist experts are trying, trying to act as you know, act as obstacles uh, towards human rights being ob obliterated uh, completely in the in, during this whole pandemic situation. Uh, yes, great. So I now like to request Baldeep to please proceed with the next discussion. Yeah, Baldeep, please continue. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Arya. Um, so we are already having a great discussion, uh, as I can see, as I can observe as well. So myself, Baldeep, uh, I'm Chief Experience Officer at ICL and Contributing Editor at Internationalism. And it's really nice to have you, Sarthak, uh, Mr. Sarthak. So um, like we indeed, like um, the uh, the um, UN Human Rights Council have been really active in these COVID times and all, and I really agree to that. Um, so uh, moving forward with the discussion, so as we discussed earlier as well, like, um, what do you think, like, um, can India become a global south, uh, like a global south country like India? So um, do you think, like, uh, does it deserve to become a permanent security member of, of the UN Security Council? And um, in addition to that, if yes or no, uh, then... What do you think? Like, what would be the, uh, you know, geopolitical backlashes or advantages as well uh, if if this happens? So what do you think about that? So, uh, can you just, uh, I mean, so can you just repeat the last part of the question of your question? I mean, I just missed out on that. Okay, sure, sure, definitely. definitely. Um, well, I had this thing in mind. Um, like, uh, can India become a uh, 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 can India become, or if it deserves to become a permanent member of the UN Security Council? Right. And, uh, right. And if yes or no, then what can be the geopolitical backlashes or advantages uh, it can face in the way? So, yes. So the Security Council right now requires that reforms. The veto has hamstrung a lot of situations. There have been consistent calls for an international tribunal for Syria starting from 2012 itself, which has been vetoed off by Russia and China for that matter. There's been issues regarding Myanmar, Rohingya, which again is something which was hamstrung by the veto. And then again, if we go to Libya, Yemen and all these countries, there we can see that the veto has acted as an obstacle towards international cooperation, something which the Security Council itself had achieved via its resolutions relating to the creation of international tribunal, tribunal for former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. But those things were in the 90s. But right now, India's most important and long-standing priority of the UN has been the demand for reform of the UN Security Council. And it is much more important at this day and age. Because as part of its advocacy on this issue, if you take note, India's position has been to seek an expansion in both the permanent and non-permanent categories of Security Council to reflect, and I quote, the contemporary realities of the 21st century, which I wanted to highlight. India is India obviously currently is a member of the Security Council as a non-permanent member of the Security Council uh, after like 10 years, if I'm not wrong. So right now it's it's obviously important. Why? Because India although has also in its uh, pledges towards uh, its membership of Security Council has highlighted the important role of multilateralism. Why multilateralism is something which India needs to take note of? Because India, the permanent five, they have lived their age. You know, honestly, it's not as if they should be removed. But right now, India, Germany, South Africa, and Brazil ought to be included because that will prevent the veto being used as a tool and a weapon for countries, in, for any private interests of countries overtaking multilateralism. And therefore, India, India, which has been committed towards the negotiations with all members of the UN pertaining to Security Council reforms from 1992, ought to be 
part of the security council right now but then obviously there are challenges which remain there are problems which remain for example in the i mean india's candidature as a permanent representative will be seen from the next two years when it's a non permanent members now if you ask me how so how can you and wind down conflicts in syria yemen and afghanistan while ensuring humanitarian aid for civilians and justice for all those so we here in this situation that's important that india takes note and leads leads forward because in the past in the past few years at the human rights council india has consistently indirectly sided with the with myanmar in the rohingya issue and the whole global community was questioning uh, myanmar's uh, role in this whole rohingya genocide if i can call it as india consistently had unfortunately and consistently sided with myanmar for that matter now when it's at the security council table that's where it will be important to see india how much of it's actually going forward with its multilateralism agenda and its uh, voice for the poor or if it's again stick by its uh, efforts at the human rights council and the actions that it had taken there so i hope that india right now as a non permanent member of the security council provides for its this uh, as the leadership capacity which obviously definitely possesses because in terms of war crimes in sri lanka and in the past it uh, even relating to hong kong uh, india had uh, raised the voice so it'll be interesting it'll be it'll be acting as a uh, test ground for india's uh, permanent membership uh, ideas yes uh, great <laughs> uh so uh, uh i hello? think it was a little bit yeah i oh. could not hear you for the last one minute okay great so i like to proceed uh for my next question i mean next step ka sir okay so uh un general assembly president that uh, mohammad bande yeah. you know he has changed a phrase like the draft declaration to uh, commemorate the 75th anniversary of the united nation yeah. after india along with the countries including united kingdom and the united states and the the country united kingdom and the united states so those countries has raised objection to the sentence like understood to the similar to wording used by the chinese communist party so what is your view upon this like uh, should we discuss upon this thing briefly yeah. uh can you can you just i mean i didn't get what you are actually asking uh, relating to india india had opposed what like i didn't i didn't get your question properly okay okay uh, now uh, there is some uh, um, is from my side so by can you please repeat this question i'll be back in 2 minutes yeah oh okay okay sure definitely definitely arya yeah. it's not a problem it's not an issue um so uh, mr sathya actually what arya wanted to ask is that uh, um ungo president mohammad uh, so mr mohammad uh, he changed the phrase in the draft declaration uh, to commemorate the 75th anniversary of united nations so um like uh, after india with uh, with countries uh, including the uk and the us raised objection to that sentence so um uh, like it can be understood to be similar wording which you which was used by the chinese communist party so um so he was uh, she was asking like what are your views upon this and uh, what do you think about this uh, uh, this this uh, the change in the sentence that that was made yeah so yes i mean i am just see that there is something which is diplomatic tact and you know language plays a important role uh, and i think it's it's difficult to make a straight jacket answer on this because i'll tell you in this currently uh, in this uh, pandemic situation it took like very almost sorry for my language it took almost uh, i think 3 months or so after the pandemic hit and after like recently when the security council uh, passed a resolution uh, condemning uh, the whole uh, situation of pandemic the global ceasefires again there was a, the the whole security council was hamstrung by nothing other than uh, the language of the resolution which has to be pointed while the us wanted to pre- prevent 
WHO and directly wanted to name China in the resolution. China wanted WHO to be at the forefront without it being named. So I think in terms of obviously India is trying to push back China's uh, probably taking over of the United Nations different bodies for that matter. And that's why I think it's, it's, it's difficult to make an assertion because by the plain reading of the line, it, it seems okay. But now when there is a backstory to it, that's where it seems complicated and it seems a little murky for that matter. So I'm not going to pass a judgment if it's right or wrong because I feel, you know, commemoration of the 75th anniversary seems okay to me. But I also also realize that India is pushing back against China's, uh, you know, imperialism at the United Nations probably. They are, being, they are trying to be an imperialist power trying to take over United Nations. And that's why I've been a vehement critic of China as well and its policies. So, uh, yeah. Um, uh, yes. Actually, okay. interesting point. Like, oh. um, one uh, assertion which actually we also can't make it clear, but it's like, but like this one. Um, what we recently saw was that uh, J73, if I'm correct, simply and. Uh, I think uh, US was not a participant uh, there. Uh, US had not left the WHO at that time. And the uh, Union and some of the Asian group tried to have a resolution. I think 50, 60 countries somewhat. Um, uh, tried to enter Taiwan and then, you know, uh, try to include the word independent investigation in that particular draft resolution. What happened was that Taiwan backed out and then the word independent was removed from the draft resolution and then I think the draft resolution was put into uh, something like that happened. So um, I completely mm. agree that I think uh, this uh, power politics game obviously affects things like I think there is one instance in 1971 when India won the Bangladesh war and uh, India was condemned by the West as a power which was inconsistent, it was tyrannic and all that. But we also know that India also affirmed its commitment that they actually tried to do somewhere down the line a kind of humanitarian intervention, which can be academically, uh, you know, criticized on all the sides of all the altars. But anyways, I think this is what it is. Yeah, exactly. Yes, Arya. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So basically, uh, I like to focus upon the one more interesting thing. Uh, about the transitional justice, we all know that uh, according to the United Nations Human Rights uh, Commission, that what he said that it is just uh, consist of the both judicial and non-judicial mechanism, like uh, including the prosecution, prosecution initiatives, uh, reparations, truth seekings. Uh, I mean, all those combinations. So. Whatever combination is chosen, that must be confirmed with the international legal standards and obligations. That is according to the rule of law of the transitional justice. So my point is, uh, so what is your view? Like, what do you think about India's stance on the concept of transitional justice? I mean, and uh, the responsibility of India to protect as a global South country. So, what is your view upon that? So, yes, so the calls for issues pertaining to transitional justice uh, primarily happens uh, in countries which are moving towards democracy. But recently, uh, we can observe in the whole Black Lives Matter movement and the problems of racism in the US, there are also calls for truth and reconciliation uh, commissions. Um, in the US for that matter, just like it was in South Africa and, and, and many other countries. So, but then obviously there are obviously objections because of the fact that India, US is a full democracy for that matter and why would there be a transitional justice mechanism? But it serves uh, to, it is important to observe that there are, there are a lot of articles, there are a lot of discussions going on, still ongoing right now. And even at the Human Rights Council, there was an attempt in those similar lines to set up an in, in independent commission to assess uh, issues pertaining to racism. But again, now if you ask me about India for that matter, India is is more or less reticent and reluctant towards uh, observing the Geneva Conventions, towards uh, ratifying the Rome Statute, towards ratifying the UN Convention Against Torture. It's because uh, for the good, bad or the ugly, we have Jammu and Kashmir, we have Northeast as uh, 
difficult spots for us to consider uh, uh, mechanisms such as transitional justice. And therefore, if I have to look at it from India's way, India is not going to be a proponent for transitional justice mechanisms. India will not stand for transitional justice mechanisms uh, being implemented within the country. Because let's be honest, let's call what it is. Like India's uh, independence has been at the backdrop of a genocide which happened that time, 1948. Then in the whole of 1984 and I think the anti-Sikh riots, there was a problem. There was a, there were calls for genocide over there as well. Then again, in, in, in 2002 was also a questionable spot in India's uh, engagement with human rights domestically at least. So I don't, and the fact that India is steadfastly opposed towards ratifying uh, conventions like torture, like the Rome Statute, and even several aspects of the Geneva Conventions, including maintaining its uh, reluctance towards implementing Common Article 3 of the Geneva Convention because of the non international armed conflict aspect, makes me feel that transitional justice is not something India will be leading its march on. Interesting. Okay. So uh, I think we are uh, almost coming to an end of for the session for the discussion uh, session. It, it's been indeed a really uh, you know insightful discussion on all the aspects. So um, this, uh, this uh, last question from my side would be. Um, so uh, like, uh, what do you think like uh, uh, in relation to legacy? Like, what legacy have diplomats such as Ashok Mukherjee? or you can say Hardeep Singh Puri, or uh, uh, even Sayyid Akbaruddin have left for Indian diplomats at the United Nations? Oh, that's a very interesting uh, question if you ask me, uh, because if, if you have to look at it, like, Indians of the United Nations have been at the forefront of a lot of things. For example, Mr. if I'm not wrong, Mr. Arkot Ramaswamy Mudaliar was India's delegate to San Francisco conference, which led the creation of the United Nations. And as I previously mentioned, Mrs. Hansa Mehta and Lakshmi, Lakshmi Menon, as well as Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, led a lot of reforms in the human rights agenda, as well as the decolonization agenda, as well as the fact that Vijay Lakshmi Pandit became the first uh, female to be the president of the UN General Assembly. And now if you look at it currently, I think it's not more, but there are like almost like eight Indians who are in senior leadership positions of the United Nations in the level of undersecretary or the assistant secretary general. So therefore, I feel Indian diplomats uh, have played a critical role, at least in their individual capacity. Because, for example, a few years back, I think two years back, uh, Sayyid Akbaruddin led India's charge towards Justice Dalbari Bhandari, retaining his seat at the Security Council, at the International Court of Justice, at the expense of a permanent member, that is of Justice Christopher Greenwood from UK. And it was all thanks to India's uh, diplomatic moves, which were uh, thanks because of the individual capacity of these diplomats that India was successful uh, in, for the first time, uh, removing a, not allowing a permanent member from the UK to retain uh, his seat at the International uh, Court. So now if you ask me, yes, individuals have played a lot of role, but there is a lot of reforms required. Like for example, India has only 914 uh, diplomats all over the world. So one of my friends, he's a Brazilian diplomat, he recently mentioned that Brazil itself has 1,500 diplomats all over the world. And we are not even comparing with the US, which has probably tens of thousands. So diplomatically, look back and introspect as to how our foreign service examinations are being held, how are we selecting diplomats, what are their core areas of, core, the core areas of expertise for that matter. So it should not be on an ad hoc basis that this particular one diplomat is perfect, while the others, but he is hamstrung by the non-assistance or the non-expertise of the others. So I think there needs to be a relook and a introspection relating to the diplomatic services and the number of diplomats uh, that are engaged across the world. A really interesting take, I must say. Um, I remember that uh, there was a very interesting. Uh, session undertaken by Ambassador uh, Ashok Mukherjee uh, and uh, he had undertaken this resolve that uh, for example there is the 2005 Tunis agenda on the ICTs and then uh, he endorsed that with the current human rights system and with the current uh, 
uh, I should say congenialities of the multilateral system um, we would really be uh, we should really be prepared to see how you know in things like cyber security or I should say even, even for the matter call collaborative governance can India help out I think that's something which Indian diplomats are doing brilliant I think the recent appointment which happened is uh, S. Thirumurthy. Mr. S. Thirumurthy, I think uh, if I am correct he uh, was he has been and he has been significant missions from you know United Nations Geneva office to I think certain important diplomatic embassies so let's see how this goes and I think there would be more interesting stories from diplomats and you know veterans to see for I mean that's something which we can also fi find uh, like my personal favorite would be uh, Mr. Syed Akburuddin and uh, uh, Mr. Hardipuri like obviously all diplomats have been doing at, at their best but that's something which I keep but anyways I think uh, we have to see how this goes and I really like the suggestion that you know the UPSC examinations where we get the IFS through which uh, the mechanisms must change and we should have you know more thinkability uh, towards international law and Indian uh, and foreign policy of, of how the education stems in so it's really really an important aspect um, so uh, I think we really had a nice discussion and I'm really grateful that we had it. So thank you so much, Sathak. And thank you so much, Aryan Bali, for moderating the session. I think it was impeccable and it really went so well. So thank you so much. It's certainly my pleasure. Yes, I mean, so we want to thank you, Team Internationalism. For yes. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah.